Yeah, I don't think anyone saw this coming. If you told me back in September of 2021 that Pac-Man World was gonna get a remaster for current-gen systems, I would have laughed in your face. But apparently Bandai Namco thought it would be funny to throw a Pac-Man-shaped curveball at my video schedule. Pac-Man World Repack was announced in June of 2022 and released on August 26th that same year internationally, with Japan getting it one day early, published by Bandai Namco and developed by Now Productions. I saw the reveal while I was at work, so I was tasked with holding back some excitement along with the five Pac-Man fans left alive. I was expecting to get to Pac-Man World 2 at minimum before this game ever got announced, let alone released. As a refresher, Pac-Man World was released in 1999 for the original PlayStation. It underwent some serious tomfoolery from its original inception, whose highlights include tank controls, a mass firing of the original staff, and the original version's cutscene apparently having been uploaded to YouTube one month prior to my video on the original game. Would have been nice to have that when I was making it. It was the subject of the second video I ever made for this channel. It's also the second video I ever made for this channel. For the love of God, don't watch it. It was from an era where I was still trying to figure out what I was doing. It's also from when I was still talking into the microphone from a rock band kit. You guys miss this audio quality? Because I certainly don't. As a refresher for my thoughts on the original, I thought the game still held up quite well, but was unbalanced in some areas. Despite some mild glitchiness, the game was a good challenge and fun to play. Besides, I gotta trash a game whose antagonist sounds like Double D. It's so unfair! You ruined everything! But as we enter current year and pac becomes old enough to be someone's dad, it's time for him to revisit his 3D platformer roots, and that's what we'll be looking at today. Full disclosure, this video is based on the Nintendo Switch version of the game. Let's begin. I think the gameplay is the most important thing to discuss first. The short version is that this game looks like the original, but it doesn't play like the original. I didn't expect this game to be a one-to-one -one recreation as it was very obvious in the first trailer that this was not going to be the case. Starting with how Pac-Man feels to move, the very first thing I noticed was that he moved very quickly. The movement is still as snappy as it used to be, but his general movement speed is much quicker than before. Contrast with this footage in the PS1 game and you can see that Pac-Man's movement is visibly a bit slower. Almost like a light jog of sorts when moving. If he was jogging in the original, he was sprinting in the remake. It took a little getting used to as throughout the game I always had the original in mind and that translated a lot to movement, leading to a lot of unneeded deaths. Never enough that I got a game over since, much like its predecessor, it hands out extra lives like candy. Once I got a full grasp on movement, it was a fun game to move around in. All of Pac-Man's attacks and moves to turn here, the rev roll is functionally the same, and the butt bounce has been tweaked just a little bit. The first two butt bounces have a brief pause in place before you go down, afterwards the bounce functions like the original with seamless movement. This threw me off the first few times, but not to the point of constantly screwing up. The chrome suit is back, same as before, but with a new twist added to it. Chrome enemies are a thing now. Some enemies you encounter will be fully chromed and can't be defeated without the chrome suit. I honestly don't have much to say about this since it didn't really seem to impact my playthrough one way or another. The chrome enemies were there, but that was about it. The power pellet sections have been altered and made somewhat easier. In the original, if you pick up a power pellet, it was on you to go after any ghosts in the area as is. This time around, Pac-Man gets huge and depending on the location, some platforms spawn to prevent you from falling into a hazard. This gives you more wiggle room to eat all the ghosts and get the maximum score possible, as well as grab any fruit or dots that may be placed over a bottomless pit. And now we have what feels like a very needless addition, the hang in the air ability. This ability is new to repack specifically and exists more for newer players who might not be very good at platformers as evidenced by the game's easy mode. Yes, not only does this game change a few things to make the platforming and collecting easier, we also have easy mode which increases the time in which this ability allows Pac-Man to do this Looney Tunes ass move where he runs in place in midair like a lethargic Yoshi trying to hover. <laughs> While I never used this move myself through the vast majority of the game, for players who feel they need an extra second of airtime to clear a gap, I can understand why it was put in. Coming back to speed though, it does feel like the levels have been tweaked to consider the speed change in their structure. I noticed some minor differences here and there. Like I said, I wasn't expecting anything to be one to one, so the changes are nice and they don't feel like they stick out. If anything, the speed change is a big help to some of the slower levels from the original. I criticized Down the Tubes for being an absolute trog of a level due to its water segment, but with how the swimming has been altered in this game, it's nowhere near as bad and I didn't want to jump out the window playing it. It feels much better this time around and faster movement helps the segment out a lot better. 
Touching on swimming, in the original you had to use two buttons, one to swim downward and one to swim upward. You swam fairly slowly, which in some levels made water segments take quite a bit to get through. In this game you sink down to the bottom by default and have a faster movement speed, on top of only needing to press one button to swim to the surface. Some aspects in the platforming also feel like they've been tweaked, some items and sections being made easier to get to and the difficulty feeling like it was toned down in a few areas. One area I can point to in particular is this section where you get one of the Pac-Man letters in the space area. In the original game, you had this large pillar with a chest directly in front of it. It's designed to mess with new players coming to the level as the letter is just off screen and the only way to see it is if you got close enough. Now that same pillar has an extra block on the side so you're able to get to the letter no matter what. Shortly after that area, building on the change made to the power pellet, you got this big section with a narrow walkway which has some ghosts. Grab a power pellet, platform spawn, and you can basically steamroll everything for the most score possible. As far as fruit goes, nowadays it's permanently kept on you. Previously whenever you entered one of the fruit doors the fruit would be removed from your person and not counted towards the slot machine at the end of each level. The amount of fruit that you had on hand whenever you finished a level would determine how many chances you get at the slots and made farming lives fairly easy. You could do the slots so long as you had fruit on hand and could leave whenever you wanted. The current version of the slot machine ignores fruit entirely. Fruit is counted towards your score at the end, but slots make the use of these tokens. Up to five tokens are scattered around each level and each one gives you a chance at the slot machine. There's a little chart which tells you how many lives each matchup is worth and I noticed the lining them was a little more difficult than before. The slots also have a new feature where on occasion you'll get this fruit bonus. This changes most if not all of the slots to two specific types of fruit and guarantees you extra lives. You pretty much have to go out of your way to miss it most of the time. I wasn't 100% sure what triggered it at first, and full honestly the first time I ran into this I wasn't paying attention to the TV and thought it was a glitch. From what I understand, if you die repeatedly, there's a better chance you can get this because I got this event a few times throughout my playthrough. It is very obviously not the same game and how it feels overall. It's simpler this time around with some difficulty tweaks. The tweaks aren't any detriment to the game as a whole, and I never really got bored playing it. Pac-Man feels great to play with, and it felt like I was having just as much fun on the Switch as it was the PlayStation. Moving on from gameplay, let's discuss the game's story. <laughs> As with the original game, it fills you in on its story with a cutscene. I won't go into picking apart every last detail like I'm a movie channel trying to figure out what Thanos was cooking, but I will highlight a few things, such as, who was this lady and what did she do with Miss Pac-Man? Well, fun fact, uh, Bandai Namco can't legally use Miss Pac-Man anymore. It's a whole complicated mess that surrounds the history of the character and her origin game. If you want a better breakdown of that, or for lack of a better word, cluster f and a good summary of why Miss Pac-Man doesn't really appear in anything new anymore, there's this really good video by another YouTuber, Joni, who goes into much further detail than I'm willing to go into right now. I'll link that in the description, you can get to that with the card on screen as well. It's the same general plot as the original game. It's Pac-Man's birthday and the ghosts kidnap every single member of the family thinking they're the real Pac-Man despite the fact that one of them is literally a dog. All the ghosts do some weird antics to kidnap each family member instead of each method being themed after the world they're kept in. Professor Pack, for instance, was located in the space-themed worlds and was abducted by aliens as a result. In the remake, they put drunk goggles on him. I'm not joking. It's extremely stupid. But I like it. He might have gotten lost in front of where he wanted to be, but the man fell over into unconsciousness through goggles that ruin your vision. Incredible. Then there's Pac-Boy, who basically dies. The original game had some voice acting, though there wasn't a lot of it. Most of it came from Takaman himself, with seldom input from the ghosts. The remake has more dialogue than the original, but no voice acting. Sort of. <laughs> There's spoken dialogue, but it's not dialogue. It's like The Sims, where they speak in gibberish, but there's subtitles. Every Pac-Man World game has some kind of voice acting in the cutscenes, so I find it a little odd they chose not to do it here. Not that this is a bad thing, voice acting isn't required through an entire game. The Pac-Man World games had it where it was needed, save for three where it was fully voice acted. It just feels like some of the character was a little lost, especially in someone like Talkman given how he acted back in the original, but with how Talkman himself is portrayed in the remake, I don't think that not having voice acting is that much of an issue in regards to him. Let's talk about that big metal idiot for a bit. 
We just started a new game on PS1, there was two parts to the opening cutscene. One with Pac-Man leaving his house and finding out about the party on Ghost Island where he's supposedly appearing, and the second one with Talkman at the party criticizing everything and generally being salty as hell. In Repack, the first piece of this cutscene is moved to the intro, with the new game cutscene taking place exclusively at the party. As for the party itself in the original game, it looked like everything was already going on and the crowd was significantly more dense. In the remake, it looks like the party is still being set up, with Talkman wandering around criticizing everything. Honestly, it makes Talkman's complaints a little more justified as not everything has started yet. He's still being a whiny little bitch, but the whininess of his complaining is toned down significantly, whereas the original had him acting entitled as all hell. Here's the introduction of Talkman in both games. You idiots! I wanted gold streamers and red balloons! But DJ stinks, the batteries are crooked, and the cake should be chocolate! You're gonna ruin my party! <laughs> The tone of the cutscene changes completely, and honestly, not having the voice acting isn't necessarily a bad thing here. In my honest opinion, the remake presents Talkman as a character much better than the original. Someone who wants Pac-Man's fame and glory, and absolutely nothing else. His presence in the game is much more pronounced than in the original as well. The original idea behind Talkman was to pose as Pac-Man and be loved and appreciated like he is. But Talkman never really made any game appearances outside of the cutscenes and his final boss. The times he did appear was somewhat cartoonish, especially towards the end. Look at how he speaks and acts in the cutscenes of the original. I thought you had captured Pac-Man! You idiots! My plans are already in motion! Oh, here I am! Love me! In Repack, he seems to be more grounded and serious, while also maintaining that aura of I'm Pac-Man and this is all about me, and that's reflected throughout the game. You are never not reminded of his presence at any point during the game. Every level of this game ends with you destroying a Talkman statue before finishing the level, and Talkman also appears at the beginning of every boss fight to introduce you to your upcoming opponent, rather than it happening just because video game. It feels like he is actively making an effort to try and stop you at every turn, and that's more than can be said about the original. Even in the intro cutscene we can see this. The flyers are getting dropped from a balloon that's in the shape of his head, and his stupid face is featured on the flyer. Image seems to be a huge thing for them this time around, and I'm all for it. I haven't even touched on his design yet, but I'll save that for the visuals section. In general, I felt he was done very well, and I liked his implementation in this game much more than the original. But what about the other bosses? What are they doing these days? The bosses in the game are reimagined while still retaining their original ideas to some capacity. They're all pretty fun to play, I've gotta say, though I do have a few small criticisms. Let's go through each one, starting with HMS Windbag. Windbag's stage is mostly unchanged in the original version. The level opens with a side-scrolling section before moving to a Switch-based battle system. The side-scrolling has been altered with more paths, with some riskier ones having more fruit to reward you with more points. He also has much more health now, requiring 10 hits across 2 segments to defeat. He has some new attack patterns which I don't remember being in the original as well. He's still the same boss when you boil it down, and I honestly don't have anything new to say. If you played HMS Windbag in the original, you played HMS Windbag in the remake. Anubis Rex still retains the mummy chase segment from the original. It felt faster paced and had more variation in terms of obstacles. The addition of fruit to the areas also makes the collector in you want to grab them and essentially throw yourself into danger. I actually found myself taking a few hits during this part because I kept getting too close to the mummy thanks to this. As for the reason I drink, I found Anubis himself to be significantly toned down from his horrifically unbalanced PS1 counterpart. Which in that case... THANK GOD! The boss is still functionally similar at a base level, run on the rev roll platforms to open his hands, and roll into the gemstone heart to deal damage. What's changed is that the platforms are no longer individual pillars, it's all one walkway that is gradually destroyed the further you progress. New attacks are introduced with each phase, just like before, but there's more variation on how it works. An enemy spawns in the center now, with dots spawning upon them being destroyed, so you have no chance to run out of dots while fighting. Anubis himself is a little more animated, slamming down onto the stages to bring meteors up while spitting them at you as well. The tornado attack returns and is functionally similar to the original, and the laser attack has been significantly nerfed, with the beam focusing on one individual area you were standing in, rather than sweeping the entire stage. I was honestly expecting some kind of challenge, and thank the lord that wasn't the case. Don't get me wrong, I still died a couple of times, but nowhere near to the extent I did back on the PS1. It's a nice breath of fresh air from the original boss, and I'm glad they took the time to balance things out the right way. 
King Galaxian is pretty much mostly the same. The unstoppable death laser exploit I mentioned in the original is now basically a mechanic. Instead of pressing each button to fire a shot, now you just hold one to fire a continuous stream. Grabbing a power pellet gives you a three-way spread shot, and it feels like they turned up the difficulty a little bit. It felt like there were more enemies and things to dodge in the first section. Galaxian himself is mostly the same in the sense that you have to destroy each eye, but a new segment was added where he uses a large tail-like turret that you have to destroy in between eye attacks in addition to the energy balls he shoots out at you. It's overall a good fight. One small criticism though, and this is nitpicky more than anything, but for some reason it didn't feel as satisfying as the original to beat this boss, I think it might have something to do with the eyes not having any clear indication of health. On top of that, you don't get any score at all for destroying any of the enemies. Ironically, it has less of an arcade feel than the original did, despite the segment being similar to Namco's old shoot 'em ups from back in the day. All the score you get is from collecting fruit, and while it felt like there was more enemies in this version of the boss, it felt like they were just things that you got out of your way rather than something you can take down for additional points. This isn't a bad boss whatsoever. If you like shoot 'em ups or bullet hell to an extent, you'd like this boss, but it didn't hit as hard as the original did. The music still does though. Cloud and Pre is... Well, it's Cloud and Pre. Gone are the bumper cars that drive worse than the Fortnite shopping carts of 2018, and in comes a go-kart that actually feels pretty good to drive. Not the biggest fan of the first-person perspective, it reminds me of a similar mode in Mario Kart 7, but the race itself actually felt pretty good. You now have boost by default, and picking up a power pellet makes you invincible, allowing you to take out other racers. Falling off the track doesn't put you back to the start anymore, and instead places you near where you fell. It's treated more like a traditional kart racer this time around. It forgives you for making mistakes while still creating setbacks should you do so. It's also a lot more visually interesting. The world around you has a lot of nice set pieces and background elements instead of this void of nothing that surrounds the track. And when you win the race, everyone basically just dies while Pac-Man smiles with glee. Beautiful. Funnily enough, the biggest change in terms of bosses, in my opinion, comes from Chrome Keeper of all things. And I don't just mean visually. If anything, he looks more like Discount Iron Giant than he did before. This time around, you have a large open stage with conveyor belts of boxes and chests. These give you items like health, dots, and fruit. Your goal here is to grab a chrome suit, run up to him, and rev roll to deal damage. It's kind of like the Anubis Rex boss to an extent. The more damage you do, the more varied his attacks become. In fact, his attacks are much more varied in general. It's not as repetitive as the old version, and actually fairly challenging. I ended up dying quite a bit to this guy. He has extending arms which he fires at you, he can stomp on the ground to cause gears to fall from the ceiling, damage him enough he'll put rocket launchers on his shoulders to shoot at you with, after a certain point, more obstacles start spawning on the conveyor belts like these boxes that spit out steam, and his final phase has these laser cannons that sweep the stage. I wonder where they got that idea. I mean it when I say that this boss was a genuine challenge. I died here more than anywhere else. And trust me, when you have to start from the beginning each time you die, it gets pretty old. Luckily, I found out that if you're fast enough, you can land a second hit on the guy to progress a little bit faster. Moving on to the big man himself, the Talkman cutscene as Pac-Man show up in the party and instead of every single ghost running in fear from Talkman, they, they kinda just crowd around Pac-Man himself. This boss, like the others, is much more varied. In each phase, skeletons spawn which give you pack dots on being destroyed. Talkman will shoot at you and fly at you with his wings while you throw dots at him. On his second phase, he'll eat a chrome suit orb and your job is to evade his carpet bombing long enough to grab your own suit and deal damage. Returning from the original is his butt bounce attack, which goes out in waves, but is much slower than before. Phase 3 is also new to this game, where he'll eat a power pellet and become huge and start stomping around. Your goal now is to attack his boots to get him to fall over. He will do a rev roll attack just like before, but you have to be careful since you can't easily avoid it this time around. Knock him down and stomp on his head three times. Pac-Man will walk away and get smacked into the cake, which conveniently had a power pellet inside. He will eat, you mash a button, and the game ends. One thing that's common throughout every single one of these bosses is the emphasis on score. These boss levels are a lot more generous with fruit and dots throwing loads of them out with each completion. Most bosses have a phase change once you reach a certain point in the fight, there's a short cutscene of the boss getting ready to double down to try and take you out, and each boss gets introduced by Talkman proper as a nice little detail rather than the boss just starting. In terms of endings, we get two different ones depending on how many of Pac-Man's family members we rescued along the way. If you rescue some or none of the family along the way, you get the game's original ending. Little Ghost Guy vents about how nobody likes ghosts, Pac-Man whips out a power pellet, eats him in front of his own kind like some kind of psychopath. Ew. 
In the remake, if you manage to rescue every single member of the family, you get a new cutscene of Pac-Man forgiving the ghost despite the fact that he kidnapped his entire family on his birthday. This ending is stupid. Both cutscenes end with the family being released, and everyone celebrating his birthday properly. At the very end of the game, we get an interactive credits sequence, which is nice to see. You get a big open maze to explore so you can collect letters that spell out thank you for playing, all to a new song about Pac-Man. A happy, energetic pop song, which... it sounds alright. <laughs> Melee created the soft spot for interactive credits for me, so this hits a lot of buttons in the right way. It's a fun way to wrap up the game. Let's talk visuals. I'm just gonna come out and say, this game looks beautiful, even on the Switch. Every single environment has been beautifully remade with new set pieces and backgrounds, and it all just looks absolutely fantastic. The enemies are given new makeovers, all given a modern look while still keeping in tune with their original versions. The mansion area in particular is my favorite. After playing the game twice over to get all the footage I needed, I have to say I like this area a lot more than any others in terms of visuals. The bosses and their new looks were applicable, all look great. Talkman in particular I like a lot this time around. He's a lot more lifelike in this incarnation compared to the crude machine from the original, still clearly villainous but more of an attempt at impersonating Pac-Man than before. Then there's the slot machine. I don't like the slot machine. It doesn't look bad or poorly made, but it doesn't feel as engaging as the original did. Now, I understand the changes made to the bonus screen from a gameplay perspective, considering the game has a heavier emphasis on score and the fruit mechanics being tweaked in general, and the whole thing being done by coins instead of, you know, the fruits and nuts that you picked up, but this doesn't feel like something goofy on Ghost Island. This looks like a gas pump. Speaking of Ghost Island though, the layout here feels like it makes a lot more sense and actually feels a lot more like an island compared to the original version. A PS1 Ghost Island was a side-scrolling hub world with each segment connected. The first three worlds are accessible and can be finished in any order before unlocking the next two, which need to be done before unlocking the final one, and it's the same case here. Instead of a side-scroller here, it's structured almost like a pyramid. The first three on the bottommost tier, the next two in the middle, and the mansion on top. As an unintended consequence, however, traveling between each section can be a bit of a trog, and I think the developers were aware of that while the game was being made, and this can apply to both games, especially if you're going back to catch anything you missed. So this time around, we actually have a little warp platform in each area. This allows you to blink to the section of the game that you want to go to. Speaking of each section, they're all still appropriately stylized about what their general theme is. The ruins look like ruins, the pirates look like a pirate town, the funhouse looks like the carnivals in town, the factory fits the setting, the mansion absolutely f and then there's the space area which honestly feels like a downgrade. The original had these multicolored rockets for each level and then repack it's... Uh, uh, hey, you like metal? This probably has more to do with the tile set used than anything, but a good chunk of this area is just sand, and for the pirates and ruins areas it makes sense, but when looking at the funhouse and factory areas, they're clearly defined and cover the entire section. Why not do that here? The sand and metal exteriors don't mesh at all. When viewing these same textures and models in the levels proper, they look fantastic, a massive step up from the original game's textures both in quality and aesthetic, but on a sandy beach by itself it doesn't work. Cover the whole floor of this junk, not just parts of it. Now for something very unique, resolution versus performance mode. In Repack, you have the option of experiencing the game in two different ways. Resolution mode, which locks the game at 1080p 30fps, and Performance mode, which lowers the sharpness of the image ever so slightly, while still retaining a great looking image on a TV and bumping the frame rate up to 60. I played the game with the capture projected onto my main monitor, and it still looks great. In my original playthrough, I kept it in the 30fps mode as that was what I started recording in and wanted to keep it that way. I didn't want random FPS jumps in the gameplay footage for consistency reasons, but man, I was kicking myself for not turning on performance mode earlier when I finally did play the game with it turned on because look at how smooth this is. You never realize how smooth 60 FPS actually is until you've sat down and watched lower frame rates for a long time. If you have to play Repack on the Switch, turn on performance mode, you won't regret it. You'll lose some of that sharpness, and from what I've seen, you'll get some frame rate drops in busier areas, but the smoothness is extremely nice to experience for this game. That said, it isn't perfect. 
Keep in mind, performance mode is a software thing. I'm still running a launch era Nintendo Switch from 2017, and to say the Switch has aged, especially as of the time of making this video, is putting it lightly. Nintendo and weaker hardware go hand in hand, but even in performance mode, it shows during the more intense scenes with a lot going on. A good example is the introduction of King Galaxian. Regardless of the mode used, there is a very noticeable drop in frames when he does that roar of his. In resolution mode, it isn't as bad, but that's primarily because the game is limited to 30 FPS rather than 60. The drop in frames is still very jarring to see. All in all, it looks fantastic and tickles the brain in all the right ways seeing this game get the remake treatment, but for now, we need to talk about sound. For this section, all songs were recorded from their original hardware as described on the screen. I apologize in advance if anything sounds odd, as I've never done comparisons for music before in this manner. I will not be discussing every single track for the sake of time, but I will say that the music of this game sounds great. Every track has been beautifully remade with a couple new ones thrown in there to keep things interesting. My only small gripe is that while you can basically listen to the original soundtrack off the CD right away, you can only listen to Repack soundtrack to the DLC, which is pretty annoying. Yep, where in 1999 you could listen to your game's music for the price of buy the game, you need to fork over an extra three dollars to listen to Repack's music. This isn't a huge deal considering the game on its own was 40 at launch compared to the usual 60 and now unfortunately usual 70 tags, but come on, it's music. I know, people sell the soundtrack separately all the time, but it's not even a downloadable file. You have to be in the game to listen to it, and the same applies to the PC version as far as I can tell. Comparing the two games together is like digging crud out of your ears that was making things hard to hear. Here's a small sampler of songs back to back. This is an addendum late into editing. I originally wanted to gush about the music here, but after listening to them both multiple times late into the editing process, they honestly sound very similar. I want to say the repack versions are a little more clear or balanced or whatever the word is, but again, I'm not a big audio guy. Judge for yourself. I could take either soundtrack personally, both for nostalgic reasons, they both sound great in their own ways. In terms of volume, they took the time to actually make things sound normal this time. The main menu didn't destroy my ears, and neither did the hammers in the funhouse. Okay, we're good. I honestly don't have too much to say. There wasn't really anything I hated that much to talk about, and any criticisms I do have, I'm saving for later. And by later, I mean about half a second from when I finish this sentence. Time to throw my rose-colored glasses out the window and complain about a few things. I already gushed about the music earlier, and don't get me wrong, the game sounds great, but there were some moments where it felt like sound effects were quiet, not very impactful, or flat out missing. Contrast with the original game where it felt like some sounds were too damn loud, this game has the opposite problem where some things are too quiet. This is especially notable in the factory levels, specifically down the tubes. In the level you got these gears coming down and crashing from above and pretty much all of the noise, the factory is basically falling apart at the seams and the obstacles make noises to reflect that. You can see and hear this in the original version of the level. Contrast with the version in Repack, which I have not altered in any way. I'm no sound engineer, 
But if giant pieces of metal are falling from the sky, you need to make it sound like there's giant pieces of metal falling from the sky. This weird absence of sound effects is present in the game over screen of all things too. This is something I didn't bring up in my video on the original. If you run out of lives, you get a view of Talkman on the main menu screen laughing at you with his name slapped onto the game's logo. <laughs> It's his big hunk of metal sparking at you, and his laughter combined with the music is a nice touch. What do we get in the remake? That! The game over music? An animation of Talkman laughing at you that loops? But nothing else. His name kinda just appears over the logo. It's the same idea as the original, but not done as well in my honest opinion. It serves the same purpose, but... That's it. This is nitpicky, I know. But a little bit of sound goes a long way. Like, you already have this sound clip of him doing this evil laugh before every boss fight. Why not use it here? Here's a mock-up with some sound effects edited in to give you an idea of what I mean. Now this might just be me, but I felt like whenever I was underwater, I had a very hard time observing depth. In the original game, Pac-Man always had a solid shadow underneath him at all times. In a typical fashion for the era, Pac-Man himself was not a 3D model. He was a 2D sprite with 3D parts, so having the solid shadow underneath was the way to go here. Very low detail, but enough to get the point across. Since we're no longer limited by the technology of the era, we have a fully modeled pack with accurate shadows to match in the remake, barring some floating whims. The original shadow not only gave you an idea of where you were in the general space of the level, but it also helped you navigate around hazards present underwater, be it a hazard built into the geometry of the level itself, or an enemy that happens to be swimming in the same body of water. This made some water segments a lot easier to navigate and much easier to avoid enemies in. Coming back to Down to Tubes, which had sharks swimming around, once you figured out where in space the sharks actually were, you could hug a part of the level that they never touched and navigate through with no issues if you didn't have the chrome suit. In Repack, Pac-Man still has the shadow, but it's somewhat low detail. Granted, the Switch is also fairly old hardware by this point, so something like a lower detail shadow is expected, and from what I can see, the shadow is consistent across all console versions. But underwater, there's no shadow whatsoever. I tried to see if this was an issue isolated to the Switch version, but I looked up some gameplay of the PS5 version and the same issue appears to be present. You can clearly see a lack of shadow underneath him while he's in the water. In terms of 100%ing, this time around I was actually able to beat this game front to back unlike the original. Though in terms of extra content for going through all the effort in doing so, unfortunately there's not that much this time around. I will restate a point I made in the original game's video that the things given to you in the original game for beating certain milestones were cool in an era with limited internet access, and my point still stands. I don't think anyone's gonna go bonkers for including concept art in a game these days as finding stuff like that is extremely easy to find nowadays, though it is still a neat thing to have out of the box. Same goes for the little blooper reel I didn't bring up in the original. It's fun, it's cute, but I can take it or leave it. Requirements wise, you need to finish the story mode, save every member of the pack family, complete every single maze, including marathon mode, access every bonus level in every stage, and get a total score of 765,000 points. Beating the game unlocks the original arcade game, while accessible right away in the original, it serves as a nice little reward for beating the game at least once. Much like before, it's simple, no-nonsense arcade Pac-Man. Nothing else to really say. I will say beating marathon mode was a bit of a letdown because you don't really get anything out of it. I know I just said that not having the gallery wasn't a huge issue, but the original was open about the fact that finishing it let you access it. It gave you motivation to actually attempt it back on the PS1. Here, it's just achievement collecting and getting 100%. There's no achievement system baked into the Switch, so it's pretty much just there for the challenge and getting 100%. I felt like I got left hanging when I blinked back to Ghost Island like nothing happened after finishing the final maze. Hell, even a congratulations pop-up would have been nice at the very least. As for getting 765k, apparently this is actually lowered from the original, which had that requirement set to 1 million points, and the reward is the same between both versions of the game in the form of the Magic Key, which allows you to open all fruit doors in the game without collecting the necessary fruit required to open them. However, if you were me, this is the last thing you did to 100% the save, so by that point, it was completely redundant. And with that said, that is everything in Pac-Man World Repack.
To summarize how I feel about the remake, overall I'd say I have a positive opinion of it. It's very nice to see this game get revisited after so many years, especially since Pac-Man World games haven't been touched in any capacity since World 3 back in the GameCube PS2 days. The last new 3D Pac-Man platformer was Ghostly Adventures 2 in 2014, and while I can't speak for the quality of that game as I've never played it, it's nice to see the classic games get some love after so long. The original was fun, in spite of its rough edges, and while this game smooths out that roughness, it does bring a couple hiccups of its own. I love both versions of this game for different reasons, and I can happily take both any day of the week. They're both fun in their own ways, and depending on the experience I want, I'll go back to the version I choose. I like this game, and while I understand that this game is now inching closer to being out for a year, I hope that it did well enough to encourage a look into the other Pac-Man World games as well. I don't remember liking World 2 as much, and World 3 was weird, but fun. And I'd like to see a modern take on both of those games someday. I can't predict the future, but hey, maybe we'll see a remake of 2 someday. Check out the playlist link on screen for my previous videos, and follow me on Twitter and Instagram. Links in description. I'm Mr. Max, we'll see you next time.